Hello, I am Brother Joseph Murphy, a monk in the Benedictine tradition. Today I am launching a four-part vlog on the Second Vatican Council, which opened on October 11, 1962, and closed on December 8, 1965. My intent in this vlog is to offer some clarity as to the importance of the Council and its meaning for those of us who actively practice the Catholic faith. In this first part, I am providing a brief historical sketch about Church Councils and why the Pope saw it necessary to call this Council at the time he did. So let's get started. In my second vlog, Monastic Musing No. 2, Ecclesiology 101, I set out the very basics of how authority is understood in the Catholic Church. I cited the passage from Matthew 16, 13 to 20, wherein Jesus gives Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and with them the power to bind and loose as he sees fit for the Church of Jesus. I also cited chapter 15 from the Acts of the Apostles, which tells of the Council of Jerusalem, which is said to have taken place around 50 AD. The passage from Matthew on the commissioning of St. Peter forms the basis for the Church's understanding of the primacy of the Pope, who, as Bishop of Rome, is Peter's successor. The Council of Jerusalem, as related in the Acts of the Apostles, set a precedent for the Church's decision-making process, and thus became the model for all future Church Councils. The Second Council of the Vatican was the 21st Council of the Catholic Church. Most of the Church's Councils took place from 50 AD until 1517. There have only been three such councils between 1545 and 1965, the Council of Trent, Vatican I, and Vatican II. The issue undertaken at the Jerusalem Council was the question of whether Gentile converts to Christianity should be required to adhere to the Mosaic Law and Jewish customs, particularly in the area of circumcision. The church leadership, the remaining apostles and early bishops and other leaders, saw the importance of making a binding decision for the church as a whole and providing guidance to all early Christian communities throughout the known world, rather than leaving such judgments in the hands of local churches. The Council of Jerusalem decided not to require compliance to Mosaic laws and customs, but clarified that certain practices in contradiction to Christian beliefs should be upheld. To abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats of strangled animals, and from unlawful marriage. If you keep free of these, you will be doing what is right. When Jesus had completed his mission on earth, he left behind his teachings and his example and instituted the Holy Eucharist. However, when it came to the details of day-to-day -day decisions as to how to spread the word and celebrate the sacraments, those judgments had to be made by the apostles and the bishops who succeeded them. Although guided by the Holy Spirit who had descended upon them at Pentecost, the leaders of the church had to use their best judgments and rely upon each other to discuss matters and make decisions that would be shared among all believers. 
The promise that what is bound on earth will be bound in heaven was taken seriously by the church from the beginning. The church holds that the Holy Spirit guides her actions to this very day and places great trust in the process of assembling the leadership, popes and bishops together to make decisions. The Pope and bishops usually try to make use of the best resources available at the time to assist in making informed decisions. These experts often involve theologians and experts in various fields of study as suit the topics being discussed. These discussions are never without controversy. Even the issue of maintaining Mosaic laws and customs at the Council of Jerusalem came out of much controversy as witnessed by the impassioned passages in the letters of St. Paul on the subject. The decision to not require adherence to Jewish practices made a bold statement about the Christian faith, that faith in Jesus and keeping His commandments were enough. It is worth noting again that most of the church councils were held within the first 1500 years of the church's existence, and that only three such councils have been held in the last 500 years. The early councils seemed to deal with major doctrinal issues such as the dual nature of Jesus, the Trinity, the place of Mary in salvation but the scope of the last three councils has been quite different indeed. The Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563 was in response to the Protestant Reformation, particularly the problematic teachings of Martin Luther. Besides clarifying doctrines and issuing condemnations, the Council also addressed abuses surrounding the sale of indulgences and other corruptive practices. Among the many documents issued by the Council was the Tridentine Roman Missal of 1570. The First Vatican Council opened on December 8, 1869 and adjourned on October 20, 1870. The main objective accomplished was defining the doctrine of papal infallibility. It also dealt with contemporary problems arising from the influence of rationalism, liberalism, and materialism. As a result of the Franco-Prussian War, the Council was indefinitely suspended. To say that the world changed a lot from 1870 until the 1950s is an understatement. Monarchies fell, republics, democracies, and despotic governments rose and fell as well. The world had experienced two major bloody wars in the first part of the 20th century, and great technological developments took place at a much faster rate than ever before. The rise of both communism and fascism, and the horrific slaughter of Jews under Adolf Hitler, and the development of the atomic bomb shook the world to its very core. Communications in newspapers, radio, the cinema, and then the television made the many corners of the world seem less remote and the entire globe feel much smaller. More people were being educated throughout the world. The feudal system that had governed Europe for centuries had fallen apart. The common man was no longer a serf working the land owned by an aristocrat, but an independent worker earning his own living and owning his own house. The place of women in society changed as they won the right to vote and own property. The collapse of the feudal system and the loss of the papal states meant that bishops, abbots, and other clergy were no longer feudal lords and princes who owned the land on which peasants lived and labored. The loss of political and temporal status in the world meant that the pope and clergy could be freer to focus on more pastoral rather than material matters, although clashes with politics and secular governments continued to occur. The crowned heads of Europe had all but disappeared. The monarchs that remained were now figureheads rather than heads of state. As the working class developed, 
so did some amount of resentment against those living a life of inherited privilege, dressing and processing about an attire that suited a time hundreds of years in the past. When Pope St. John XXIII was elected in 1958, the world had become a much different place than it was barely 50 years before. This Pope had lived through both wars and had witnessed and once intervened in the deportation of Jews. He was himself the son of a poor peasant farmer. Perhaps his life experience in observing the growing tensions of the Cold War and the Western world influenced Pope John's bold move to convoke the Second Vatican Council. I highly recommend the 2002 motion picture production of John the 23rd starring Ed Asner. It is surprisingly well done as religious movies go, particularly on Catholic subjects. It retells the entire life of Angelo Roncalli, born on a remote farm in northern Italy, and after a long and eventful life, rose in the ranks to become the 261st Pope of the Catholic Church. I believe this biopic makes clear the life experiences that shaped him to be the good Pope who called the Second Vatican Council. Thank you for watching this introductory video on the Second Vatican Council. In the second part of this vlog, I shall talk about the Council reform that touched the lives of all Catholics worldwide, the liturgical reforms of the Mass. If you haven't already, please like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so that you will not miss the next installment. Please visit my website, Our Lady of Refuge Monastery.org. Until next time, peace be with you. He was himself the son of a poor pheasant. <laughs>